Okay. All right. So, welcome to 3551 Feedback Control Systems. Uh, this is the first course in controls. It builds upon signals and systems, which I assume everyone has taken because that's a prerequisite for this class. Uh, I'm going to be recording all the lectures and I'll upload it to YouTube. Uh, so that way you will have access to the lectures. Even if you could not attend the class, you can actually watch the lectures later on. Uh, what else? Uh, so so I have I have been recording lectures for my courses for the last two years and so far the response has been pretty positive so I'm assuming you guys will also like the fact that you have lectures available even if you couldn't attend the class you can actually watch it later on uh, I have uh, the course text as modern control system by Dorf and Bishop uh, unfortunately I've written on the sheet at second edition but actually it's 12th edition so not second uh, so this is the course uh, you say, text. Did you say 12th edition? 12th, yeah. So please make a correction there. So this is the book, and this is the 12th edition of the book. Uh, the reason why book would be needed is, so there are a lot of books available online for feedback control systems, so you don't particularly have to buy the book. But some of the assignments would be from the book. And this is an official text for this particular class. So. If you want, you can buy it. If you want, you can borrow it from someone just to look at the uh, assignment questions. Uh, otherwise, most of what I'm going to teach is available online for you to uh, read from many other online textbooks. Um, and I'm going to post some of those links in the Carmen page so you can have access to some of those books. The evaluation policy consists of uh, six homeworks, two midterms, one project, and one final exam. The final exam is scheduled on December 6th, so make sure you don't book your tickets right now. Oh, well, you can book your tickets, but book it after December 6th. Uh, prerequisite is 3050. Uh, homework policy is you have to write your own homeworks. You can't copy the homework from someone else. You have to write your own code. You can't copy the code of someone else. Uh, but you can definitely discuss the question with your peers as well as with me and with the TA. Uh, the TA will be holding an office hour, and I also hold two office hours, so um, you will have ample opportunity to interact with the TA as well as me, and if you have any questions or any concerns or if you have difficulty understanding any of the concepts, feel absolutely free to either come to my office hours or go to TA's office hours. So far, the TA hasn't informed me what time he wants to uh, hold the office hours because he himself has registered for X number of courses and he'll pick two or three for the semester and then he will know exactly what time he would be available. So we will inform you about TA's office hours in due course of time. Um, my office hours will be Monday 4.15 to 5.30 p.m. and Friday 11 a.m. to 12 noon in 464 Dries Lab. Dries Lab is right across the road from here. Topics to be covered. So we are going to cover a large number of topics on feedback control system. So we'll talk about stability, root locus method for controller design, PID controllers design, frequency response method, Nyquist plot, and lead and lag controller design. These are some of the very basic controllers that people use in a wide variety of settings. And so we will cover how exactly you design controllers for systems um, using various tools and techniques that have been developed over the past 100 years. Okay, any questions so far on the course policies? No? Okay. Uh, I'm going to be using these two blackboards primarily, so, and maybe a little bit of this. So make sure that you guys sit on this side of the room and not on that side of the room. Okay. So what are feedback systems? So I want to give you a little bit of history because Control systems has been uh, one of the primary drivers of technological revolution in 17th, 18th, and 19th century, and it's, it's still ongoing, okay? Uh, feedback is interconnect, I mean, uh, a control system is an interconnection of dynamical systems, okay? So in this case, you have a dynamical system, which is a plant, 
and you have another dynamical system which is called a controller. And the controller looks at the input signal and then it processes that input signal to an actuation signal. That actuation signal goes into the plant. The plant implements that signal and then you get some output. Okay? And this idea, even though you might feel that, okay, this looks like a very obvious idea, uh, it's actually not, uh, not that obvious. And the first well-known example of a feedback system is the centrifugal governor, which was developed by James Watt in somewhere around 1750s, 1750s, 1760s. So who knows James Watt? I'm assuming many of you should know because you are in ECE 3551. So James Watt is known as the inventor of steam engine. Okay? But he was not the, the actual inventor of steam engine. He was able to develop the first feedback controller for a steam engine without having any mathematical knowledge of what a feedback controller does. So that was, uh, it was his ingenious idea. Okay, so he thought, so what was the problem? The problem was back in the 1750s, you have a steam engine, you put coal in the steam engine, the steam gets produced, it goes into the engine, the engine starts rotating, and then that prop uh, propels the train or whatever um, other thing that they were trying to do with steam engine. And the problem with that was that the person who is driving the steam engine is supposed to constantly monitor what the speed is and based on the speed it has to figure out how much coal to put in the plant. Okay, and there were many, many accidents and thousands, well not thousands, but many people have died in those steam accidents, steam engine accidents because the operator did not carefully figure out how much coal to put so there was overproduction of steam and then things blew up at that time. So. James Watt thought it's a very important problem. So what he did was he, com he created a mechanical governor which was connected to the engine. So when the engine rotates faster, the governor rotates faster, and there was mechanical linkages within the governor which made sure that the steam is blocked from getting into the engine if it is rotating too fast. Okay, if the engine is rotating too fast, the governor will stop the steam from flowing into the engine. Okay, and that was his ingenious idea, and that saved a lot of lives, and that has almost propelled the Industrial Revolution after 1750. Okay, so it's a very beautiful idea, very beautiful concept that he came up with without knowing the whole theory of feedback control systems, and made a huge impact on the civilization or rather the whole mankind, okay? Then uh, Maxwell wrote the first paper, you know James Clark Maxwell, you must have studied some electromagnetic waves, blah, 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 right? So you must have studied about Maxwell's equation. So the same Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell, he wrote the first paper analyzing the performance of governor in a paper, I think in 1858, okay? So that was about 100 years or 90 years after James Watt developed Governor. And then there was a large number of publications after that on feedback control systems. But then the second most important revolution in feedback control systems happened around 1920s, okay? What was the reason? Can someone, can someone tell me what was the most important technological breakthrough around 1920? 1910s, 1920s. Would it be related to World War I? Uh, well, yeah, but not quite. When was telephone invented? Roughly 1890s, okay, and so 1910s onwards, telephone became commonplace. And the problem with telephone was in the long distance communication, the signal gets. Uh, yeah, this, so the signal weakens as it propagates through the medium, okay? And so they needed to amplify the signal. But whenever they amplify the signal in telephone networks, it also amplified the noise, okay? And it amplified a lot of other things that shouldn't be amplified. 
And, and that was a big problem. So AT&T Bell, AT&T, which is, well, it's still around. So AT&T was one of those big telephone companies at that time. Uh, so, so it was called Bell Labs at that particular point of time. So Bell Labs thought that they will try and design a better amplifier for telephone systems. And so they hired a lot of mathematicians, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of good mathematicians were hired by Bell Labs in those days. And they developed the theory of modern control system, which is what we are going to study in this particular course. So that was developed between 1920 all the way to 1950. So that's the era, that's the theory we, we are going to study in this particular class. Um, one of the people who, um, who developed these control design techniques was Henrik Bode, and he is a graduate from The Ohio State University. Okay, so he was here maybe on this campus in 1924-25, around that time, and he played a seminal role in developing control theory, and he's a fellow Buckeye, so that's, that's a good thing. So hopefully 100 years later, somebody will say, someone from this class developed cool controllers and changed the world. I would be very happy if that happened. I can go around saying, oh, I taught him feedback control systems, him or her. Okay, so what's the basic uh, block diagram of a control system? So you have, you have an actuator, you have a plant, you could have some noise into the plant, you have sensors, you have filters, Okay, so this is what a modern control system would look like. So this is, of course, a very simplified abstraction of what a modern control system looks like. Okay. So what are plants? Plants is actually a system with an input and an output. Okay. Um, it could be an engine, it could be an automotive engine, it could be an aircraft engine, it could be a uh, room like this, okay? The actuators are something, uh, are, are, are devices that acts upon the plant. So air conditioning system acts upon this room and cools down the temperature of the room or heats up the temperature of the room, right? So room is the plant. Actuator is the uh, air conditioning system. Sensors are devices that senses the output of the plant. So this is the temperature sensor or the thermostat in the room. Well, not the thermostat actually. Thermostat would be the, this part. Okay, so sensors is the temperature sensor of the room that sends information to what is known as controller. Controller filters any sensor noise they have. If, so you could have analog control system or you could have a digital control system in the form of a microcontroller. So if it is a digital control system, the, the filtered output will go through an analog to digital converter that information will go to the computer. The computer will calculate what is it that we want to do. Uh, so for this particular room, perhaps the thermostat is set at, where is the thermostat? I don't, oh, there it is. So it may be set at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so the computer thinks, okay, I have to maintain the temperature of the room at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. 
what should I do? Okay, so computer is go going to calculate that. And then it will send that information via a digital to analog converter to the actuator, which is the air conditioning system. And then the actuator will start pumping air into the system in order to either heat up or cool down, depending upon the set point. Okay. You could have a car engine, automotive engine. The actuator is the fuel injection system that injects fuel into the engine. And then the sensors, which are usually outside the engine, would sense how much carbon dioxide, how much NOx, how much SOx emissions are coming out of the engine. And then based on that, goes through a controller and figures out how much fuel to inject and how much air to inject into the engine. OK? And this is what we are going to study in this class. And we are going to study not digital control system, but analog control system. Uh, but it has to do all these things automatically. <clears throat> the plant always suffers from some amount of noise, okay? And one of the goals of control system is to minimize the effect of noise uh, and make sure that the plant is acting according to some desired performance index. So to give you an example of noise, consider this room. What do you think is the source of noise in this room? So I'm looking at the temperature of the room, and I want to identify what is the source of noise in this particular room. Yes? Any air that's like rushing in or like going out from, from the hallway? Perfect. So air rushing in and going out to the hallway. Uh, body heat generated by us. Body heat generated by us. Anything else? Heat generated by computing devices, right? Yes. Yes, the heat generated by the by the bulbs and the tube lights. Yes. No, that's not a noise because it doesn't change the temperature of the room. Oh, for temperature. Now, yeah, for the temperature, not not anything else. Okay. So these are the noises that are acting on the system now. Some of you may walk out of the room, and that also acts as a noise, because uh, it reduces the amount of heat that was being expelled into the room. Okay? So we'll talk about what kind of noise that is. It's called a step noise. Okay? So we'll talk about it in due course of time. So uh, the goal of the controller is Look at the output. So this is the output coming from the sensor. Compare it to desired behavior. Desired behavior. And then actuate to effect the change. OK, that's what a controller is supposed to do. In the James Watt example, the plant was a steam engine. The actuator was the steam inlet. The sensor was the governor, which was designed by, well, uh, the governor was actually sensor plus this controller itself. OK, so it was this plus this block together. And that was actuating the plant. And the goal of this particular controller in that, but, uh, so the goal of governor was to look at the output, which is the speed of the engine, compare it to the desired behavior, which is the desired speed of the engine, and then actuate to effect the chain, which is close, shut off, or open the valve that is letting the steam into the, the steam engine. Okay? So at home, we have different uh, controllers. Water heater, it's a control system. It looks at the desired temperature of the water heater and then uh, either burns the gas or 
uses electricity to heat up the water. Uh, we have, of course, air conditioning system, thermostats. In large systems, uh, like in power systems, you have a lot of controllers that does what is known as frequency control. Okay, so I want to pause here. And I want you to think, what happens if I turn on a light bulb? OK? How do you think you are getting the electricity? So when I turn on the light bulb, I am demanding electricity from the system, right? And the system is this whole big power system spreading across the country, and in fact, also connecting to Canada and Mexico and so on. So I am demanding 100 watt of more power from this power system. Okay, who is going to provide me with that 100 watt of power? Any thoughts? Generators, right? Yeah, generators. So they want to increase their production by 100 watt in order to make sure that your light bulb, whenever you ask for the light bulb to be turned on, the light bulb turns on. So in order to get that signal for the generator to bump up its generation, it's going to look at the frequency, which is 60 hertz in US, and it's different for different countries. So in, in, in US, the electricity that you get is at 60 hertz. So when you turn on the light, the 60 hertz drops a little bit. It becomes 59.99999 hertz. And the generator gets the signal, and then it starts spinning faster. It starts injecting more fuel into the engine, and then it starts uh, rotating faster so that 60 hertz is maintained. Okay. Now, if the air conditioning system turns on, or if you turn on the uh, iron, you will see, you will notice that there is uh, your light bulb becomes dim for like a fraction of a second, and then it becomes normal again. And that is control systems in action. Because when you start demanding 1,000 watts, 1,500 watts, 2,000 watts of electricity, it reduces the frequency a little bit. And then the generator starts acting uh, and starts producing more and more electricity in order to make sure that the frequency is maintained at 60 hertz. Okay, So that's why you see a dip in the lights when you turn on a very large load. and Within a fraction of a second, that information gets relayed to the generator, and the generator starts generating, and you see everything turns back to normal. So that is a, a big control system acting on a power system. Air traffic control manages the flight paths and so on in order to make sure no two flights collide. And that's a giant control system in itself. There is packet switching in internet. So it decides which of the channels are available and then sends the packet through those channels. Uh, that's a control system. And that is a very complicated, well, not complicated, but the decision has to be very quick. It can't spend time thinking about, oh, I think the packet should go on this side or go on this route or go on that route. So it has to work in real time, almost real time. Cruise control in car is a control system. It maintains the speed of the car at a specific set point. Then you have adaptive cruise control in the car, which is slightly more sophisticated, because if the traffic in front of you stops, the adaptive cruise control will also stop your car. Okay, So it uses, it has more sophisticated sensors to make sure that your car stops if the traffic in front of you stops. That isn't possible with just the vanilla cruise control that used to be in cars produced in 2010 and before that. <clears throat> so I want to now give you some success stories about feedback control systems. The so first one is Wright Brothers, who were born in Dayton, so that's not far from here. And they are known as inventors of aircraft. Okay, But the funny thing is, they actually didn't build the whole aircraft. The idea of aircraft was there even before Wright Brothers were born. And there were many people who were trying to develop a powered flying machine so that they, they could take people from point A to point B. What Wright brothers were successful in was designing the control system for a powered flight. Okay, So they developed vertical tail 
for the flights and they developed a nice engine in order to propel the flight and they that's why they are known as uh, inventors of uh, aircraft but they are but i want you to understand that they are not inventors well they are called inventors of aircraft but they actually invented the control system for the aircraft not the aircraft itself that idea has been around for long long time the second uh, success story for control system is the mars rover i don't know how many of you have seen the video 6 minutes of terror has any of you seen that video before you have seen it okay how many who else Six minutes of terror. No one else has seen it. So it's there. It's posted on Carmen. So it tells you how exactly the automatic control system within the Mars rover works when the spacecraft, when the spacecraft leaves the Earth's gravitational pull and enters the Mars gravitational pull. So it tells you how the entire landing system is created, and the important thing is all of it has to be automated. All of it has to be sensor based. the sensors captures all the information that is needed for intelligent decision making goes into the actuator and that eventually allows the spacecraft to land on the surface of the planet so you should definitely watch that video it will give you a good idea of what a control systems is like then later i mean in today's world there is a lot of buzz around about autonomous cars which are going to be i mean if it gets realized i am of the opinion that there will be no autonomous cars for another 100 years but there are many investors who have lots of money believe that which is good uh, that gives us funding for research uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, but the dream is that you can put more and more sensors on the car like camera lidar uh, radars and so on you can process the information through a intelligently designed controller and then you can press the accelerator brake and steering in a manner to drive a car in a safe fashion okay so this is known as feedback control because the sensor information goes into the controller so it feeds into the controller and then that feedback is sent to the actuator okay so that's why it's known as feedback control Uh, we have so far talked about success stories of feedback control but feedback is not always good uh, one of the important problems that appear when you have feedback is instability okay so whenever you want to have a desired change if there is an error and the controller aims to amplify the error then it leads to a in unstable plant and the example scenario here is a microphone that is close to a speaker okay and you have heard that screeching sound and that comes because the microphone which is the sensor picks up the signal coming out of the uh coming out of the speaker and then it goes through the controller whose goal is to amplify the signal that is being received at the microphone end and then it goes through the actuator which then which is basically an electric circuit which then drives the speaker and that closes the loop and it leads to instability because the controller is acting as an amplifier in that situation so it leads to instability also if your sensor is noisy and without this filtering scheme you can amplify the noise of the sensor and then that could also lead to uh, undesirable behavior at the plant end so to give you an example current gps can give you 3 meters of accuracy on the ground okay 95% of the time if you use this and so 3 meters is how much is 3 meters okay it would be somewhere like this to maybe this much okay so that's 3 meters now imagine that you are driving a car Uh, an autonomous car using gps signals which provides you an accuracy only up to 3 meters and you could potentially bump it to another car if you are using gps signal without any filtering scheme and uh, and that's because 
your sensor, which is GPS sensor, has inherent limitations because of which your error will be three meters. And if your controller amplifies that three meters, you can bump into another car, which is an undesirable behavior for an autonomous car. OK, so feedback. So that's why design of feedback control is an important topic. We need to understand how to design a controller so that things don't go unstable or things don't behave in a manner that is undesirable for the users of that particular uh, system. Any questions so far on the motivation? So this was all motivation. I'm, I hope by now you are like all in, all motivated to study feedback control. And I guess nobody will drop the class uh, after the maybe half an hour introduction. OK, good. So now I want to get, well, the, uh, the final uh, thing that I want to say is that feedback control by its very nature is very mathematical. So we are going to, you have taken signals and systems, so you know how much math we use in that particular course. This course will be two times the math you used in signals and systems. So if you like maths, this course is going to be awesome. If you don't like maths, I'm sorry. OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So the first thing that we want to study is block diagrams. OK. And the block diagrams is a way to abstract individual components of a system. OK. So this is the block diagram that we will study throughout the course. Uh, well, This is the reference. So the idea of block diagram was developed somewhere around 1930s to represent individual components of a complex system. Uh, and the idea was you could study each of the component in isolation and then try to create the interconnection in such a manner that it is, it leads to a desirable performance. And this is the most basic diagram, block diagram, that we use in control system, uh, which has a reference signal, a controller, a plant with some actuation noise, and a sensor. This is your output. Let's say that sensor is equal to 1. So you can measure the output exactly and in the same quantity as the reference signal. So if the reference signal is speed, you can compute the speed exactly. And so I'm going to use 1 instead of sensor here. So let's just consider that the sensor outputs exactly what the output is in the same uh, metric as the reference signal. What is the input to the controller in this case? Okay, so there is a negative sign here. Okay, so what's the input to the controller? It's reference minus output, which is known as error. OK? So the controller is looking at the difference between the reference signal, what my reference speed should be, and the output, what my actual speed is. The controller takes as input the error, 
and it generates a control signal which gets added to actuation noise okay so as we have discussed there are lots of noises in the environment and the total effect of the control signal and actuation noise is then applied to the plant that leads to the output at the next time step so in the case of a car the actuation noise could be the wind speed okay so if you have a lot of wind uh, you will notice that your car doesn't really do what you ask it to do it sort of shakes a little bit goes in random directions just a little bit because of the wind speed which acts as an actuation noise to your control signal so typically in a car at this point of time you are the controller your brain is the controller which looks at the velocity and then decides how much accelerator to uh, press and how much uh, uh, how, what should the steering angle be you could also have actuation noise due to slope of the road okay so you're driving on a straight road suddenly it starts sloping up or it starts sloping down and that changes the dynamics of the plant and that also can be considered as an actuation noise okay so that's a simple concept of block diagram this diagram is something that we'll refer to again and again throughout the course you could have more complex block diagrams so you could have c1 c2 c3 c4 and then something like this okay so this is another block diagram and you can create more complex block diagrams uh, in a similar fashion depending upon what the system looks like so one of the things that we will do in the subsequent class is how to how to create blocks that is a composition of this block and this block okay so let's say i want to replace this with a single block okay what should that single block look like so this would <coughs> some new block n c4 that's it oh there is a okay so how do you how do you write n which is a block as a function of c1 c2 and c3 okay so this is the first thing we will try and cover in the course so i think that's the topic in the next class <coughs> and the second thing which we are going to do is modeling which is each plant or controller or circuit or whatever uh, you are looking at it has a physics based dynamics equation so how do you derive those equations so that's called modeling so we'll do the modeling of the plant and we'll do the block diagram reduction uh in the subsequent classes okay um i don't have time to cover um any of the next topics so i guess i'll i'll end the class now and so we'll meet again next uh, friday and we'll go over the next steps which is perhaps modeling and block diagram can you explain why you uh put sensor as a one what does that mean again it means that the so the question is uh why did i put one there mm -hmm. the answer is consider the velocity of a car okay there are many sensors that can actually accurately compute what the velocity of the car is right and we just want the velocity of the car to get fed back to the reference signal so it's just okay. one so yeah. one just means that this is the actual this is the actual failure. yeah sometimes when you let's say you are using camera for instance then you have to process the output of the camera in order to compute what the velocity is and so there you will have a block diagram that is an algorithm that takes input as image and computes velocity 
So I don't, I don't know if this is a reasonable question, but let's say we had a sensor that was 0.9, I guess. Does that mean it has an error to it? No, it just means that it... Like